As the Ethiopian civil war continues to ravage that country, refugees are trying to escape the violence. But what happens when those refugees end up at the church that holds the Ark of the Covenant? And then we travel to Prussia to take a look at the story of a man, a captain in the Prussian military, who was accused of stealing a ring. After he is sentenced to 40 years, he does the only sensible thing. Turn into mist and float away. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. Sometimes I'm even stunned at how ridiculous these stories sound. Speaking of ridiculous, it's ridiculous how much you guys support this show. And speaking of supporters, two segues for one. Coming into Dead Rabbit Command right now, we have Ryder Blue. Everyone give a round of applause to Ryder Blue. Ryder is currently riding a white horse. A Pegasus, we didn't know it. We didn't know it. The, the wings were folded up. Ryder, thank you so much for supporting the show. You're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, that's fine too. Just help spread the word about the show. Really, really helps out a lot. So Ryder, dismount that horse. We're going to put you in a much, much better vehicle than that. The Jason Jalopy. It is cooler. You don't have to feed it. You got to put gas in it. It doesn't poop, though. I don't know if Pegasus poop, actually. But it's still better. It's still better. It's an old-timey Chitty Chitty Bing Bing car. It can fly, too. We don't use that option much, but it can fly. Ryder, I'm tossing you your own set of keys to the Jason Jalopy. Hit that old-timey horn. We are leaving behind Dead Rabbit Command. We are headed out to Ethiopia. So we're going to use our flying thing, and it has, like, the two umbrellas that go, whoop, 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 whoop. People are like, Jason, <laughs> no, I've never watched Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you big weirdo. Anyways, flying car. It's an old car. Ryder doesn't even know how to, how to pilot it. He thought he was just going to drive it around. We're headed out to Ethiopia. This story was recommended to me by Gray of PTA via Twitter, so really, really appreciate it, Gray. We wave to him. He's in a little life raft in the ocean. We don't stop to save him, but we ra- wave to him as we fly over the ocean. Ryder's now driving us through Ethiopia. Guys, put on your helmets. Put on put on more than your helmets. Put on your full body armor, your mech suit, because there's currently a civil war going on in Ethiopia. This story just happened. This story just happened January 2021. We're driving through Ethiopia, and you have the Tigray People's Liberation Front versus the Ethiopian government. And the Ethiopian government, to kind of shore up their defenses, has started recruiting local militia groups as well. Never really goes well when you do that, because you'll have like a dedicated team of people who are like professional soldiers, and then a bunch of hillbillies. Then a bunch of hillbillies being like, hey, we love to shoot stuff. We shoot stuff on the weekends, so why don't we join up? Now, I know like, you know, militias can be good, like with the American Revolution and things like that, But you got to be careful because the militias are all going to have their own end goal. So that's what's going on right now. Basically, there's a civil war or insurrection, depending on how what side you're on. This has been going on since November 2020. So it's fairly a new war. Now, you have the people who are fighting the war and you have the hillbillies who are running around being like, yeehaw. And then you have the people who are just like living a normal life. They just want to put a chicken in their pot and have a car in their garage, and there's this war popping off. So they're like, I'm out. You have tens of thousands of refugees leaving these areas as these combatants are moving in. One day, a thousand of these refugees end up at the Church of St. Mary of Zion. Now, it's actually a complex. There's quite a few buildings here, but it's this complex that's in Ethiopia. It's a church. But this church is known, we actually covered this on the show a long time ago, this church is known as possibly holding the Ark of the Covenant, a.k.a. the biblical superweapon, a.k.a. the plot device in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's basically a box with these huge wooden sticks through it. You're like, Jason, please don't describe the Ark of the Covenant. Because <laughs> I know you're going to watch it. It's this box. That has like two angels on it. I'm actually describing the plot. I'm actually describing the prop from Raiders of the Lost Ark. But I've seen drawings of it too. I've never seen the real thing. It's this big box. Apparently, um, with like the Jews were like when they were getting beat up back in old time days, they carried this box with them. And every so often they'd open it up and a bunch of people would die. And I think they used it and a wall fell down. Although that may have been a guy playing a horn. A guy on a horn made a fall. Well, it's been a long time since I've been in church, but I think they were like knocking over buildings with it and they're killing people with it. You're like, Jason, do that 
episode. Don't, don't just gloss over the biblical super weapon. I think you guys are all familiar with the Ark of the Covenant. And apparently, if you touch it with your bare hands, you drop dead. It's in the Bible. That, like, this isn't an apocryphal story like the Book of the Giants or anything like that. Like, this is a plot device in the Bible. And some people have said maybe it's some sort of UFO. Um, not, not, they're not actually carrying a flying saucer, but maybe it's some sort of UFO technology. Some people say it's radioactive, and that's why if you touch it, you die. But that doesn't make sense because radiation doesn't stop when you put wooden poles through it. Apparently, you have to have the wooden poles through it to carry it. But you can't open it. You can't touch it. It'll kill you on the spot. If you open it, your enemies will die, but you won't die. It's kind of a cool... It's kind of a... It's a cool concept. It's a cool concept. But there's always been this thing of where has it been? Why can't Daniel Jones find it? Will he find it before the Nazis do? And so there's been different locations of where the Ark may have ended up, because in the Bible, I don't think they ever state that it was destroyed. So who knows? But one of the claimed spots of it is the Church of St. Mary of Zion. And you have this religious compound, for lack of a better term, and one of the buildings in it has the Ark, and only one person can really deal with the Ark, and he can never leave the building. I mean, I don't think he can never leave the building. He can never leave the compound. He's not like, help, help, let me out. The ark sneaking up behind it with a dagger. Ah! I think he can leave the building, but he can't leave the religious compound. He can't go out and get snacks and then go back. Hey, guys, what I miss is the ark is opened up. A bunch of, like, school kids pushed it open on a dare. Anyways... It's protect. It's a super weapon. If if this is actually the location of the Ark, and there is, like I did discuss in an earlier episode, there is a reason why people think it could have been there, because a lot of stuff was shuffled out of the Middle East into Africa. So it may be there. It may be there. We don't know. We're not the one guy. You have to be the one guy to know the truth. That's the perfect way to keep everything hidden. But it, it's claimed to be there, and now you have all these refugees running around trying to escape the battles. But then you have, like, the two people who are fighting, the Liberation Front and the Ethiopian government. When you see a bunch of people run around, you don't know if they're, like, enemy reinforcements. You don't know if they're uh, civilians. You don't know. So they're keeping track of them. Now, obviously, a normal person would go, oh, those people who are just carrying, like, sleeping bags and their children, they're probably refugees from this horrible war going on. But for whatever reason, the Ethiopian government and their militias were following these thousand people to the Church of St. Mary of Zion. So they all go into the church, and that's generally a lot of times we see that happen in these type of situations. You try to find sanctuary in your place of worship. It's kind of like neutral ground, like Highlander. But unfortunately, reality is far more grim than Highlander. It's actually more like Highlander 4. Because the Ethiopian army gets there, and you have a thousand people in this compound, and the Ethiopian army gets there, and as the church leaders are talking, they go, okay, this is what we're afraid of. The Ethiopian army is going to come into the complex, and they're going to take the Ark of the Covenant. So what do you do in that case? It's, this is a very, very interesting story, and I really appreciate that Gray of PTA sent this to me. Because on the one hand, you have a biblical superweapon, a holy relic. And on the other hand, you have a thousand people. And, you know, even if you're even if you're just casually aware of the Bible, a lot of it is about, you know, like self-sacrifice and turning the other cheek and things like that. Martyring yourself, martyring yourself. When I was raised in the church, a lot of it was about how uh, the Christians martyred themselves to the Romans. Even though their body is destroyed, their soul lives on. So it didn't matter that the Romans were slaughtering them, throwing them into the lion cages. That was part of the test of faith. And you just did it. You didn't fight back. You got eaten by the lions. Maybe you'd fight the lions, but there wasn't any real sort of armed resistance. The Christians just let it happen. So you do have this thing about martyrdom in Christianity. But you don't know if these thousand people, <laughs> you don't know how devout these thousand people were. They're like, ah, I don't care, but I'm not Christian. I'm atheist. I'm just running from this army. They get to this compound, the Ethiopian army is there, and the church leaders make a decision. As long as these thousand people are here, they're actually threatening the Ark. So they pushed these thousand people out of the complex where they were very quickly slaughtered by the Ethiopian government. 750 of the 1,000 people were killed on that spot. The Ark is safe, however. 
That's such a, I mean, it's such a bizarre trade-off, because I think, even though, like, you could think about the martyrdom and stuff like that, that has to be a personal decision, and again, they might have not even been Christian, so you can't be like, go martyr yourself, and you're like, what, no, I'm Scientologist, no, 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 and they're getting pushed outside. You can't do that, it might not even be, it might not even be the real Ark of the Covenant, which makes it doubly tragic. And what's even weirder about this whole... So on the one hand, you could go... If the Ethiopian army wanted to take the Ark, why wouldn't they just go in, would be your question. If they really wanted... If that was their end goal, why wouldn't they go in? Well, they wouldn't have a reason to. If the thousand people were in there, they could go in and take the Ark, or at least take a look at it, and say, well, we had to go in. There was a thousand members of this Liberation Front group running around, when it was really just refugees. But you go, Jason, are you just giving them motives, now you're trying to make it sound... First off, they murdered 750 people. So they did do that. I'm not casting dispersions on the Ethiopian government and their militia forces. They massacred 750 people. In January 2021, this just happened. The reason why we know about it was 250 of them were able to escape, and they reported this to the local media, being like, oh, dude, a bunch of people got killed over there. And of course, the Ethiopian government's like, nothing to see. They're like, can we go visit the bodies? They're like, no, no, the bodies... I mean, there's no bodies, there's no bodies. But you can't see it anyways. They're kind of blocking off that whole area. But as far as we know, they didn't get the Ark of the Covenant. But you go, Jason, is there any... Maybe it was. They were just after the Liberation Front. Maybe the Ark of the Covenant had nothing to do with this. Check this out. There is a religious bent to this whole thing. Because in November, so back when this first started, government troops were shelling this town, bombarding this town with artillery fire in Ethiopia, and it had one of the first mosques in Africa. It's been there since the 7th century. It's actually so well known, it's considered a holy site in the Islamic religion. They built this mosque in this town, and they had documents and writings they had the badly bones of these people from the seventh century this all happened in the seventh century you had writings and everything like that this was a holy site the it was being shelled by the government the whole town was and they were telling people nothing to see here nothing to see here <laughs> smoke is rising from the mosque they're like no no we didn't hit the mosque it turns out that not only did they bomb the mosque but when people went in afterwards the writings were gone and the like memorial the shrine where the bones were was disturbed so they're thinking that e- the theory is actually it's more than a theory alleged i gotta throw allegedly in here real quick but that ethiopian troops went in and sacked the mosque after they bombed it and were taking all of these ancient religious writings out of the mosque not for safekeeping by the way it's not like the guy has a museum back at his house they, they, they're gone now so there is a precedent of them. And, you know, now that I say that, they had covered that up for months. Like, that happened in November, and they covered it up. Maybe the Ark is gone. We wouldn't know. No one would know, really. There's only one person who can confirm that it was there. Bizarre story. It's a bizarre story all around. One, all the people dying because of this insurrection, civil war. And then them dying to protect a relic that may not even be the actual relic. And then the fact that it may be the relic, and the government of Ethiopia may actually be running around collecting holy relics for who knows what reason. It's a triple threat. It's just a bizarre story all around. So hopefully they don't have the Ark of the Covenant because it doesn't sound like they're the most stable government to begin with, massacring 750 people because they don't know if they're the good guys or the bad guys. That generally makes you the bad guy. Ryder, let's go ahead and call in that Carpenter Copter. We are leaving behind Ethiopia. We are headed out to old-timey pressure. We're waving goodbye to Ethiopia. Hopefully this war is very short and the good guys win. Sometimes during a war, it's hard to tell who the good guys are. But again, it tends not to be the people who murder 750 people outside of a church. I'm just saying. Just saying, right? As we're leaving behind, I wanted to do this real quickly. I wanted to give you guys a Dead Rabbit Recommends. We've been having a lot of these recently. This isn't a Dead Rabbit Recommends. This is a Dead Rabbit Insists. I insist you watch this movie. I'm a very busy person. I have a daily podcast, which in hindsight is a ton of work. I love doing it. It takes up a ton of my time. Plus, I have all the other normal stressors that everyone else has. So when I take the time out of my week to watch the same movie twice by myself, 
It's a Dead Rabbit insists you watch this movie. It's very rare that I watch the same movie twice by myself, and especially within the same week. The Night Eats the World. It's a zombie film. It is on point. It's like an hour and a half long. It's the perfect length. Every scene works. The cinematography is great. The directing is great. It's terrifying. It's realistic. It's, it's amazing. It's, I just stumbled across it on accident. I was scrolling through Amazon Prime. The Night Eats the World. I watched it twice in maybe about four days. And even if you're not a, if you're a zombie fan, you have to watch this movie. If you're not a zombie fan, this movie is the reason why people love zombie stories. It is just boiled down to its pure essence. It's, and I don't want to tell you anything else about it. I don't want to tell you anything else about it. I knew nothing about the plot going in. It, it is, it's, it is a, an amazing zombie movie. <laughs> so good. And you guys know I watch a ton of them. I watch zombie movies all the time. So yeah, I don't, I still don't know. There's Train to Busan, Dawn of the Dead, and this. And that list, that order keeps changing. This is so different. that Those two movies are action movies, and this movie has action in it, but it's realistic. It's, it's, it, 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 I, guys, watch The Night Eats the World. Seriously, check it out. It's only, I mean, again, and when's the last time you saw a movie that was an hour and a half long? Most movies are too long nowadays. So Unless it's called Transformers 3, then it's three hours. That's perfect. But yeah, it's perfectly paced. Watch The Night Eats the World. <laughs> Carpenter Copter is leaving behind. My movie recommendation. I've been talking about the movie to like people around me. I've been like, hey, I can't stop talking about that movie. But yeah, uh, The Night Eats the World. Really, check it out. A writer is flying. He's like, dude, you're telling me to go to old time Russia. We're like Stone Age Russia. He went too far back in time. Sorry, writer. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's not talk about the movie anymore. Uh, we're headed to late 1700s, early 1800s Prussia. He's like, oh, there we go. Dials it in. <laughs> Carpenter Copter is now in early 1800s Prussia, to be specific. Ryder flies us over this old town. He hits a button, so the Carpenter Copter's disguised now. It just looks like a windmill. It's a flying windmill. No one notices it. We land. We get out. We're wearing a bunch of old-timey Prussian clothes. And... I just shrugged my shoulders. I don't even know. I don't even know. I imagine those pointy hats. We look like colonial people. We look like we're American colonial people. We're walking through Prussia, and we get to this little town, and we see there's a man on his knees on the street, and, and it's we can tell there's a mob scene. There's a bunch of authorities standing around with their billy clubs. All the town population is surrounding them. The mayor is openly weeping. <laughs> Like, that is son or something like that? And we see the man in the center of the circle is on his knees. He's really in trouble because the police don't look too happy about it. He's a military man. We can tell from his uniform. <laughs> I don't know what Prussians wear, but I'm an expert at their military uniforms. He's on his knees, and they're taking his medals off of his uniform one by one and throwing them on the ground. And they're like, you disgrace to the military. Take another medal off. You suck. That word hasn't been invented yet, but you're the reason why we invented it. They're taking these medals off. They're throwing them on the ground. And the mayor's like, he's my buddy. Uh, very surreal image. But here's the thing, too. It's like, you, if you know how these mob scenes work. The population should be throwing tomatoes at this guy. They should be like, boo, boo. We don't know what he's done at this point. But it's weird to have a mob scene where it's pretty quiet. And the only ones who are really pissed off about stuff are the authorities there. The townspeople came out, and it almost seems like they're there to give the criminal some moral support. Who we're looking at is Captain Fritz Allswinger. He's on his knees, and they keep taking these medals off of him. You have military officials there, and they're just shaking their head the whole time. Their necks are getting sore. They're like, dude, can we hurry this up? I'm so tired of shaking my head. And eventually, Colonel Fritz Allswinger... They pick him up off the ground, and they go, His sentence for his crime is thus. He will be taken to prison for a short while. Then we will brand him on the back the word thief, which actually be kind of badass. And then, this part's not badass, and then he is going to be sent to the galleys 
which is the big rowing things, you know, like when you're in the boat and you're like rowing the oars. Not like row, row, row your boat. Not like the song. It's like the guy with the drum. Boom, 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 boom. You're rowing like that. He's going to be sent to the galleys for the rest of his life. That is the sentence that we have laid down on Colonel Fritz Allswinger for his horrible crime, his crime against you all, his crime against the nation of Prussia itself. And everyone's just quiet. And the mayor's like, oh, my buddy. And as they're leading Colonel Fritz Allswinger off, he turns to one of the military officials and go, hey, before you do all that stuff, before you throw me in prison and brand me and make me do the galley thing, I'd like to have a one-on-one with the general. Not, not for his car insurance, the general of the military. And so they, yeah, yeah, sure, you know. Because no one really wanted to do this. So he sits down with the general and he goes, I'm not Captain Fritz Allswinger. I did the crime. I committed that horrible, atrocious crime. But I'm not Captain Fritz Allswinger. My name is Did Ricky. Then we go back in time. We're headed back in time just a couple of years. Did Ricky? Did, did he? I don't know. <laughs> I'm almost positive that's not how he pronounced his name. But anyway, Did Ricky is the son of a shoemaker. He's this poor boy in Prussia. He can never really do things quite right. He's always trying to run like some little scam. He's basically a little he's like a little rascal, but he's an adult. So it's no longer cute and endearing. You're actually a petty criminal at this point. But he's kind of just moving from job to job. At one point, he was like making ice cream, but not like real American ice cream, like just ice and then like gross uh, berries on it and stuff. So that didn't last very long. That didn't last very long. Eventually, he's just standing on the street corner, not like selling his body, or is he? I don't know. Did Ricky do that? No, he's just standing on the street corner one day, and he hears a bunch of people laughing at him. And Did Ricky is standing there, and he looks up, and he sees a bunch of army dudes laughing at him. He's like, what? <laughs> he can't really do anything, right? This bunch of army guys, what's he going to do, fight them? And one of them goes, yeah, you're right, you're right. He does look like me. And that's when Did Ricky kind of looks a little bit closer at the group of people and sees his clone standing there standing in this group of military officials is lieutenant fritz allswinger and he's kind of leaning up against his back in the 18th they didn't have cars he's kind of leaning up against his wagon it's an old-timey wagon it's like there's a mule in front of it he's leaning against his wagon and he's like hey you look just like me and did ricky is like yeah yeah i I guess i can kind of see the resemblance i mean obviously you've shaved and you've eaten well and There's a lot of things that show that you're richer than I am, but other than that, other than the malnourishment, we look exactly alike. And Lieutenant Fritz goes, hey, guys, you know what would be hilarious? I'm going to hire this dude as my valet. This guy's going to be my butler. He's going to do a bunch of stuff for me. And it'll be so funny because he looks just like me. Now, I'm sure everyone else is going, yeah, that's kind of funny for like a day or two. How long can you, I mean, sure, like, Would Mike Tyson hire a butler that looks like Mike Tyson? And how long would that gimmick be good? But anyways, Lieutenant Fritz goes, are you doing anything? And did Ricky's like, "Uh, no, I'm actually petty criminal. (laughs) It's just in between jobs right now. So what happens is Lieutenant Fritz hires did Ricky on the spot and becomes his valet. And sure enough, Fritz thinks it's so funny to do this. Now, Fritz, in the, he's like the military class. He was raised in these families. He was destined to be in the military. So he's well off. He has his house. He has all of his servants and things like that. Did Ricky's walking around. He's like, whoa, dude, this place is totally awesome. There's tons of stuff I can steal from here. But I better not. I better not steal anything. And Lieutenant Fritz keeps doing this. He thinks it's so funny. He'll change clothes with Did Ricky. He'll be like, okay, so... Let's go to this big party where they're expecting me, but I want you to be dressed in my uniform, and I'm going to be dressed like a hobo. And then we'll... <laughs> Did Ricky's like, I don't dress like a hobo. He's like, yeah, 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 you can't dress like a hobo. But we go in there, and then it'll be so funny because they'll think it's you, and then I'll be like, ha-ha, I'm the real Lieutenant Fritz. They did this all the time. And Did Ricky was living the good life. He gets to do all this cool stuff with his buddy. Not really his buddy, it's his boss, but he gets to eat well. He gets to sleep in a nice bed he gets to sleep in a bed it doesn't matter if it's nice at this point he's living in a mansion so one morning he wakes up he's like hey boss we're gonna do that whole thing the same thing we do every single day (laughs) opens the door to lieutenant fritz's room and fritz is dead stone cold dead 
And did Ricky's like, damn it. This sucks because he's going to be fired. <laughs> like, they're like, that tends to happen. When the master dies, all the servants have to go get other jobs. But he's not even a real servant. He's not part of this long tradition of butlers and maids. He's just some dude off the street. So thinking incredibly quickly, he undresses the corpse, puts on the corpse. And maybe he didn't wear the corpse's clothes. <laughs> the guy had a full closet behind him. He just put on regular clothes. He wasn't like taking off poop-filled underwear from when he died. He probably just put on regular clothes, but he did take the body and put his old clothes on it, carry the body to his room, and then wake people up and be like, oh no, did Ricky is dead. They looked exactly alike. But obviously their education was different, and did Ricky knew that. He knew that if he was going to pull this scam off for a long enough time, preferably forever, because he's now a very wealthy, respected man, he had to change some stuff. He had to get it figured out real quick. First off, part of the thing that was so funny about him was, did Ricky normally has a very kind of rough-and-tumble way of talking, hey, matey, he wasn't a pirate, but you know what I mean? He was from the streets. So he wasn't this well-educated man. So he's like, first thing I have to do is change that. Get to speak more intelligible. So for the first three weeks, he doesn't really say anything. Because this is when he's the most vulnerable. Because he's around all the servants. He knew that he had to be very careful. So he's silent for three weeks. He's not a monk, but he doesn't talk a lot for the first three weeks. He's really trying to limit it. And people just figure, and he kind of says, well, you know, I'm depressed. That was my buddy. My poor buddy, that amazing guy, Diedrich. He, he pretty much kept his mouth shut. Then he is able to secure a transfer away from Prussia. He's able to secure a transfer to a totally new location. So now he's like, this is going to work. I'm not going to be around my servants, any of my co-workers slash servants. So I don't have to worry about them figuring it out. I keep going to work. They keep asking me about like battle plans and stuff like that. I don't know about that. Plus, my coworkers know the old Lieutenant Fritz. I'm going to get transferred to this new location. Brand new start. And I'll be super rich. I'll just hire new servants there. Or no servants. I don't need servants. But I'll probably get some anyways. So he gets that transfer. But before he can transfer over, he gets contacted by his family, Lieutenant Fritz's family in Italy, and they say, oh, we heard you got a transfer. We want to celebrate it. Come visit us. He's like, damn it, damn it. This is not going to work. This is so amazing. And this is uh, one of the reasons why I love this story. I just stumbled across this the other day. And I want this to be a reminder. We're doing that 90 days to a better you challenge where I want everyone to be in a better position at the beginning of May than they are right now. This guy who was the son of a shoemaker who grew up on the streets, who was a petty criminal, he has to go to Italy to visit the family of the, the family of the man he's impersonating. He learned Italian in three weeks. I mean, it was life or death, right? He learns it, Italian in three weeks. He goes out to Italy and he meets his dad, his sister, and his mom, and he fools his father and his sister. Because they look exactly alike, but the mother knows something is wrong. The mother can sense that something's wrong with her son. And so he starts avoiding her. You can almost do a, yeah, like a spin-off sitcom about him trying to outwit his own mother and get out of town before she figures it out. But he does. He's actually able to evade her long enough. Then he's sent to his new position. While he is working in his new position makes a ton of friends he's actually becomes good friends with the mayor the people in town love him he is such a well-respected official everyone's like this is one of the best military minds we've ever met and he's so nice it's almost like he wasn't raised in the military it's almost like he was one of us who achieved a high status super nice guys hanging out with everyone everyone loves him he gets promoted he gets promoted. He was Lieutenant Allswinger. Now he gets promoted to Captain Fritz Allswinger. But this all falls apart when one day a man is approached about a ring he has. They go, that ring's stolen. And he goes, what? No way. This ring's not stolen. I bought it. And they go, maybe you, maybe you bought a stolen ring. He goes, that's impossible because the man I bought it from, Captain Fritz Allswinger. You're like, what? But the ring was stolen. It's not like nowadays if you found like some ring from Kay's Jewelers on the ground, you would never prove that it was stolen. But, you know, back in old-timey 
everywhere. They're hand making jewelry. So people were like, no, that's obviously my jewelry. Like my fingerprints are still in it from when I was pressing the gold down. They are able to track this ring back to Captain Fritz Allswanger, and he was boarding in this house when the ring went missing. So he stole it. It wasn't he wasn't unjustly accused. And at this point, did Ricky knows the game is up? There's a lot. I, I mean, I was reading this. I go, why did he steal the ring? First off, your first question is, why did he steal the ring in the first place? Once a thief, always a thief. Secondly, life in the galleys, rowing a boat for stealing a ring. That was his sentence. He was going to spend the rest of his life rowing in some galleon as it was shooting cannonballs at Napoleon or something like that. It'd be the rest of his life, but he imagine he wouldn't be living that long and get branded thief on his back for stealing a ring. Insane, dude. But anyways, they do the crime, and back then, that you do the time, which was the rest of your life. And then we're back to the point where when the authorities are doing this big public display to shame him, no one wanted a part of it. The people all loved this guy. The mayor was weeping. No one wanted to see this happen. And then he admitted what the story was. And when the story gets out, it obviously is big news. It turns out that the mother in Italy was actually very relieved. She said, this is kind of a touching thing. She goes, it's sad to know that my son died. But on the other hand, what really broke my heart was when I saw my son, I could tell he didn't love me. And I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't figure out why my son didn't love me. And that broke my heart. So it actually gave her peace to know that her son had passed on and not that her son didn't love her. Isn't that, it's just kind of a, I mean, she's not like, good, my son's dead. (laughs) You know what I mean? But she's saying like, people, it was just a different feeling for her. She was sad that she lost her son, but it even hurt her even more. She couldn't figure out why her son no longer loved her. Because did Ricky didn't love her. So here's where we get to the story. This, I mean, that story, I, very fascinating. But when you look up did Ricky in the internet, don't try pronouncing his name, just type it in. That whole story is compressed into two sentences. I actually had to dig for that story because I was very, very curious. When you look at list of like five crazy people who just up and vanished on like Lister or Gawker list or BuzzFeed list or whatever, any of those things, you'll often see Did Ricky pop up because his ending is what made him famous. That story was really popular at the time it happened. But the reason why we know about Did Ricky now is because of how he vanished. He was sentenced before he had to get the thief thing in the galleys. He was sentenced to Weichschligmund prison and they were actually doing a switch over they were switching it over from like a prussian prison to a french prison or one way or the other so they were moving these prisoners around now did ricky is just a normal prisoner at this point he had tried escaping before so he's in leg shackles and while he's walking with these other prisoners as they're being shuffled in front of these prisoners and these guards are standing there did ricky kind of turns from side to side and goes nah i'm through Snaps his fingers. I don't know if he snapped his fingers, but I'm adding that. Everyone turns around and they watch him turn to mist. And he floats out of his shackles. Now you'll see that story repeated a a lot online. If you look up Did Ricky, that's what you'll see. Then you'll see they'll go, he impersonated his boss. He got arrested for that. Then he turned into mist and no one's seen him since. Obviously, you want to keep digging on a story like that. There's a lot of witnesses, but it's also old-timey, so you have to say, like, maybe just a cloud went by. (laughs) He just shuffled off real slow, and then they didn't see him walking around the corner. So, did he actually turn to mist? You're, like, shaking your head. You're like, probably not. Let's take a look at this. One of the stories is that he turned to mist. The other one is that the same situation, he was walking with these other prisoners, and there was guards around, and in a moment, he's able to figure out a way to unhook himself, and then he runs away, and everyone turns and looks, and they see him running away. No mist involved, no paranormal activity involved, but he did escape. They looked for him, they never found him. So you'll see that sometimes, even in these lists where they're like, people who disappear, oh my... You'll, they'll usually give a rational answer, they'll say, but other people say he just, un- <laughs> he didn't turn to mist. Most people would say you can't turn to mist. He just unlocked himself and walked away. So again, I dug into the story and I was able to find a really cool account on anomalyinfo.com. That's where I got that full story about did Ricky and all of those. That's a true story and how he did that. Most of the times you'll just see a brief explanation 
that he traded places with his boss. So I'm thankful to Anomaly Info for bringing out that full story. But they also got this part of the story. It is true that he did disappear. But again, the truth is somewhere in between him just unlocking the leg shackles and him turning himself into mist. Apparently when he was being transferred, when the French troops were handing this stuff over to the Prussians, they gave him this sheet and there's 30 names on this list and one of them has next to the name missing. The Prussian guards go, well, that's not the way we work. You kind of got to give us some information. Well, you know, here's the thing. He did try escaping before we had him in leg shackles. We were actually bringing him over this wall, like this landing area. And on one side of it is a bunch of guards escorting these troops. And on the other side of it is the Vistula River. And then we turned around and he wasn't there anymore. So he may have escaped into the river, which I mean, he's wearing heavy iron chains. It would be a very short escape. It could be that he fell into the river. Some people have thought that the French just got tired of listening to him talk about how dope he was and what a great military commander he was. And they pushed him into the river. Some people think that he was killed on purpose. But it's interesting because all of that stuff, it was dark at night. All of that stuff, you can imagine the place was swirling with mist. And you turn around and someone's just gone. Someone who was there is gone. So I find that a very fitting end for a man who was able to slip out of the chains of being a lower class citizen. Whether or not he turned into mist... Or he, or he butterfingered himself and drowned in the river. It doesn't really matter. Did Ricky is a legend. A legend whose, <laughs> whose name will be mispronounced throughout the ages. But a legend nonetheless. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. Twitter is at DeadRabbitRadio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Shh.